The 376th edition of the Four Corners Podcast starts right now. This is the Four Corners Podcast. And that could make a difference. Lawson at the buzzer. Got it! Maybe not. Ty Lawson wins it at the buzzer. Deep three. And Green rips down the rebound in traffic. Four on one. What a great job. What a terrific job in transition. I mean, you could plan that any better as a coach. Gets the roll. Here we go. Page has it. Carolina down one. 84-83. Page into the front court with four seconds. Page to the rim. Got, got it. Good. He got it. Nine tenths of a second to go. Inbounds. Washington gets it to Warren. His full court shot. No good. Marcus oh, Page baby. does it for the Tar Heels. Carolina wins it. Don't force it if you're Goss. Comes in. Blocked what? by Meeks. Buried right up ahead to Jackson. And he takes it down for the five point lead. Matthews off the mark. And this year, the confetti. It's going to fall for North Carolina. They're not going to be denied this time. Inside 30 overall. Love. Ooh. Top of the key. Oh! Big time delivery. Here are your hosts, Josh Marlowe and Anthony Pagnotta. Hello and welcome inside, inside another live edition of the Four Corners Podcast. Hanging out with you. On a Tuesday night, a little over 48 hours away before Carolina returns to action in the NCAA tournament, they'll face Alabama in the West Regional Semifinal with a spot in the Elite Eight on the line. That game will come your way approximately 9.39 p.m. on CBS on Thursday um, as the NCAA tournament gets back going uh, on that night and Carolina with the second game in L.A., they will follow uh, the Arizona-Clemson game, uh, which will tip off at shortly a little after 7 o'clock. We're here to do what we always do. We're going to preview um, the opponent, which is the Alabama Crimson Tide, tell you everything you need to know about uh, their team and the season that they've had. Look at uh, this game from Carolina's perspective. Look at some of the history of, of, of Carolina in California uh, and, and in Los Angeles specifically, which is where this uh, this regional semifinal will take will take place. We'll discuss uh, a topic or two before we give our keys to the game and pick the game. But uh, we start every edition of the pod as we always do. Pod thought of the day, and um, you know we go with uh, the same you know the, the same saying this time of the year. It's the same thing we'll say before every game because. It's the foundation and the hallmark and the calling card of the program, which is play hard, play smart, play together. I tweeted out 10 minutes before every game uh, that Carolina plays in. It's a superstition that I have as a fan. It's something that I believe in. And, um, you know, that, you know, those words led Carolina to the regular season that they've had. And um, a big reason why Carolina is still playing is, They've played hard. They've played smart. But as we saw throughout different times in the Miss, in the Michigan State game, they played together. And um, at this point in time of the year, uh, the best teams are going to emerge victorious. Not the best players, not the best coaches, the best teams. And um, I think we're confident in saying that when Carolina plays hard, when Carolina plays smart, and when Carolina plays together – they're as good as anybody and compete with anybody that college basketball has to offer. Yeah, and I mean they they definitely looked like that. Um, you know, in the first weekend, I think you know it was kind of there there were ebbs and flows. There were times where uh, you know the guys were definitely struggling and, and needed to um, rally around one another. But you could see, man, this this group is is so tight. And I think the other day you saw it you know, even more so when Carolina was going through their struggles, you know, RJ Davis said afterwards, 
to a question that I asked him, um, you know, in the post game locker room interviews, he said, you know, I, I just told guys, you know, we've been here before. Um, let's stay calm and, and do what we know we can do. And I think last year, you know, you wonder at times if there were people that, you know, on the team just said, you know, to whoever was speaking up, you know, because of how separated we heard the locker room potentially was, would just be like, yeah, I, I don't really, you know, or I, I'm not really listening to what you say. Uh, but you could see that now this is a group that's so together. They're fighting for each other. And, um, you know, I think the, the one, th the other element of that, when you talk about to get together um, and, and everybody doing their part, you know, we wondered coming in because we had seen in the ACC tournament that it was really all on RJ. It was all on Armando to handle the load for Carolina. And both of those guys have played really, really well out of the gate. But you've seen good performances from Cormac Ryan. I think both of the games so far have been pretty solid for him. Uh, and I think Harrison Ingram, uh, especially in that second game the other day, he was huge. And so I think that's the biggest thing that we're going to be looking for as we get into – this next weekend is did they build enough momentum? Is this a group that, you know, is going to be able to score around their two best players? Because if they, if they do, I think we've seen that they play, they, they play smart enough. Um, there's no question. There's never been a question with this team that they play hard. Um, and I think, you know, at this point we're, we're seeing that playing together means everybody's stepping up. And so far they've done that through the first two rounds. And they'll need that to carry over into their next matchup, which will be their toughest of the NCAA tournament so far, that being the Alabama Crimson Tide, who bring with them a 23-11 and record. They went 13-5 and in the SEC in the regular season. They made their way to the Sweet 16 after dispatching of Charleston and Grand Canyon. Um, now this was a team that was on upset alert, quite frankly, in both games with the way that they uh, defend at certain times. But um, that was not to be the case. Their talent, their their experience carries them to two wins in the NCAA tournament. Um, they have four players that average double-figure scoring, led by Mark Sears, and it's 21.5 points per game, 4.2 rebounds, 4.2 assists. He's doing that while shooting 51% from the field, 44% from three. Uh, Aaron Estrada, their second leading scorer, 13.3 points, 5.4 rebounds, 4.7 assists. He shoots 45% from the field, 31% from three. Grant Nelson, their third leading scorer, 11.4 points, 5.4 rebounds, 1.6 assists. He shoots 49% from the field, 27% from three. And then Ryland Griffin, their last guy to average double figures, 11 points, 3.4 rebounds, 1.8 assists. He shoots 45% from the field, 38% from three. This is the highest scoring team in college basketball at 90.7 points per game, but they give up 80.9 points per game conversely, which is 355th in the country, and that's out of 362 teams in Division One. They make 30.4 field goals per game, the fifth most in the country. They attempt 64.6 field goals per game, the seventh most in the country. Um, and the number that we're all going to be talking about and looking at, they make on average 11 threes per game, the third most in college basketball, and they attempt 30.1 three-pointers per game, the fourth most in college basketball. They uh, run an NBA style of offense, which means – um, they take one of three shots, a layup, a three, or a free throw. Analytics are their calling card. Um, it has allowed Nate Oaks to, to turn them into a winner in the SEC um, and make, you know, Alabama people care about Alabama basketball. It's a fun brand of basketball to watch. It's an entertaining brand of basketball to watch for casual viewers. Um, for betters, you probably want to lean the over on this game because um, I think it's fair to expect both of these two teams to score. And for a Carolina team that can be explosive on offense, but they're at their best when they're competing uh, defensively and, and creating offense off of their defense. Um, I know Carolina has seen some talented teams. They've seen UConn. 
They've seen Kentucky. They've seen Duke. Um, this figures to be uh, the biggest challenge they've seen all season long from a team's offense because you know there's literally not a team that scores it better than Alabama, and you're hard pressed to find a more efficient offense than what the Crimson Tide will show up in this matchup with on Thursday night. Yeah, I mean, this is honestly one of the best offensive teams I think we've ever seen in college basketball. I mean, in terms of the way that they play, you're right. It does seem almost pro-like um, in that they value the three-pointer a lot more because it gives you a chance to score more. Uh, but they're incredibly aggressive. They get to the line a ton, seventh most uh, made, field, made free throws in the country. And so – I think that's going to be a big thing. Like, those are two things that Carolina just has to be prepared for. Like, if you try to make this team beat you inside, I mean, look, they they still – I mean, they still average a, just a little under 22-point field goal makes per game, which is 99th in the country. It just shows you how many possessions they honestly play. And this is one of the rare times, and credit to Bone on the Mac and Bone show this morning – um, or I think it was yesterday morning, talking about this game. And he said, you know, one of the things is, is that, yeah, Carolina is a team that is capable of running, and there has to be moments where Carolina wants to run. But this is also one of those scenarios where it might almost benefit Carolina to slow it down a little bit in certain in certain circumstances and try to muddy this game up just a little bit. Because you saw when Grand Canyon did it the other night with them, that gave them a chance to win that game. Now, for Carolina, the talent level is way above where Grand Canyon's is. But I don't think it's the worst thing to try to slow things down because this team, I mean, they want to play the, the most frenetic pace of just about anybody in the country. I think it. I think they are eighth in pace, which, I mean, when you watch this team, you honestly say to yourself, how are there seven other teams that play faster than them? Um, but I, I do think that, you know, this is a team that Carolina is – you know, going to be able to attack because defensively, I mean, they give up a ton of field goal attempts, and it makes sense when you play with the pace that they do. But, I mean, they're not a great defensive team on the interior. That's where a lot of teams have attacked them, and that's where they've allowed a ton of baskets. They're really good uh, three po- uh, defensively uh, when it comes to threes. I mean, they're only allowing a 31 point. Uh, 3% clip from beyond the arc, but they still allow a little over seven made threes per game. So um, I, I do think that this is this is the thing that we've talked about with them. They allow a ton of points because of the way that they play. They're a team that has been susceptible inside at times. And the other thing that I don't think a lot of people have talked about with them, not only do they get to the foul line a lot, they foul a lot on the other end. Teams are shooting uh, 25.3 field goals, uh, free th- free throws, rather, per game against them, which is 356th in the entire country. Made free throws, 18.7 a game, 359th in the country. So the opportunities are going to be there for Carolina if they attack. But that's the thing. Carolina's got to have that attacking mindset because – it will be comfortable, especially if Alabama starts to score in this game, to say, hey, let's try to you know match them bucket for bucket, especially if this team starts hitting shots from the outside. And I think Carolina's got to be careful to try not to do that. Look at this game from the Carolina perspective. They show with a 29-7 and record seeking the first 30-win season um, under Hubert Davis. They went 17-3. and in the ACC in the regular season. Um, They advanced to the Sweet 16, of course, after beating Wagner and Michigan State last weekend in Charlotte. Um, In regional semifinal action, Carolina is a healthy 28-9, and Um, so this stage will not be uh, anything new to them. Against Alabama, um, Carolina is 8-5, and and, of course, the the two teams played a instant classic last year out in Portland, um, a game that Carolina lost in four overtimes. The Heels have four players average double-figure scoring, led by R.J. Davis, 21.3 points per game, 3.6 rebounds, 3.4 assists. He shoots 44% from the field, 41% from three. 
Armando Baycott, 14.4 points, 10.2 rebounds, 1.6 assists. He shoots 55% from the field. Harrison Ingram, the third leading scorer, 12.2 points, 8.8 rebounds, 2.1 assists. He shoots 43% from the field, 39% from three. And then Cormac Ryan, the last guy to average double-figure scoring at 11.3 points per game, 2.8 rebounds, 1.2 assists. He shoots 38% from the field and 34% from three. And we all, uh, we've documented all season long uh, just how good Carolina is as a rebounding team, among one of the 10 best rebounding teams in all of college basketball. You look at Carolina's history in California and L.A., it's a little uneven. Um, Carolina all time is 16 and 8 in the state of California, but just 5 and 6 uh, in Los Angeles. They're 2 and 3 in Los Angeles in the NCAA tournament. Their two wins uh, took place in 1968 when they beat Ohio State in the national semifinal to advance to the national championship game, and they beat Louisville in 1972 in the consolation game at the Final Four. Uh, to finish in third place back when uh, the consolation game was still a part of the Final Four festivities. There are three losses. Of course, they lost the 68 final to UCLA. They lost to Florida State in the semis in 72. And most recently, they lost to Wisconsin in 2015 in the Sweet 16. And, um, you know, I think when you look at this game on paper and you and you wonder about, the the firepower does I mean look for Carolina to be a defensive team and they're at their best when they're playing good defensively they've got four guys that average double figure scores uh and you've got talented offensive players that against a team like Alabama you're hoping that Carolina can exploit and take advantage of because we talked about so much entering the tournament there was this need for uh, another score to emerge around RJ and Armando because you wouldn't go far in this tournament without having a third score. And that's the case. And I think this game offers the opportunity for Harrison Ingram to build off what he did against uh, Michigan State in the second round and for a guy like Cormac Ryan to get back in a rhythm and put the ball in the basket because – this is a team that basically the back half of the SEC season was given up 90. It felt like every time they, 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 they took the court. We all saw how much they gave up to, uh, you know, at Kentucky and Rupp Arena. They gave up like 117 in regulation. They gave up a lot of points to Florida. I think Carolina's talent uh, is far superior than what Florida has to offer. So um, I know you were talking about, you know, this might be a game that Carolina wants to – make it more of a half court. But I got to tell you, I disagree with that. You got the athletes, you've got the horses, you've got the talent. If Alabama wants to go up and down the floor with you, I think that favors Carolina because I think Carolina has the talent and the skill set to rise to the occasion and win a game if they have to win a game, scoring in the you know upper 80s, low 90s, maybe even the 100s. Well, the problem is if you're playing the pace they want to play at, you're going to have to score in in the hundreds, easy. Um, and that's where it, it's it's smart to control the pace. That's the biggest thing is control the pace because Alabama, I mean, they want to play up and down. They they run no matter what. I mean, it could be one on five. They're going to attempt to run down the floor. And for Carolina, I mean, look, there, there are moments you got to pick your moments where you where you run against this team because again, I I think you're talented enough to pretty much do whatever you want in this game. You can control everything about this game. So that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying don't run with this team because I think that Carolina has the horses to be able to do that. There's no doubt about it. But I think if you're turning it into a track meet instead of you know, just doing what you've done best so far this year at times, which is just controlling the pace of games by the way you play defensively. And, and, and I mean, look, the, this is a team that at times can play in the half court. I'm not saying that you want to see that all the time, but you don't want to have to try to force the issue with, you know, a guy like Elliot Cadeau who's been turning the ball over a lot here, is struggling um, just in general. 
Uh, and, you know, even R.J. Davis at times, I mean, yeah, running the floor has, has led to success for him. But he's also a guy that I think you could argue at times this year has been better with some of the stuff that he's done in the half court. So that's the thing is just be strategic with it. And if you control the pace of this game and don't let it get to an up and down scoring, because that's that's the way Alabama wins games. I mean, yeah, they've allowed a ton of points. There's no doubt about that. I mean, they came in, it was three of their last six games, they allowed over 100 points. And I still think Carolina could get there. But they showed you in the in the first two rounds of the tournament that, you know, when they get out in space, Alabama, that's, that's when they're going to score. And that can be the difference in the game. Um, because here's the thing. I don't think Alabama can compete with you if – you if you turn this into a defensive game if you if you find a way to create the turnovers that are going to be there i mean alabama averages 12 a game so they and a part of it is their pace but that's the thing if they turn it over and you're going to slow things down occasionally i mean it's going to limit the possessions that they have and i mean yeah they're an extremely efficient team especially a guy like mark sears but as we saw the other night against grand canyon it wasn't their best shooting night and it made it a little bit uglier than they probably wanted it and gave Grand Canyon a chance to win that game. So, I mean, Carolina, I, I think, you know, they, they have they have what it takes to beat this team. They have more talent than this team. They have more depth than this team does. But this is one of those teams that kind of scares Carolina fans because of the way that they shoot the ball. So, I mean, it's it to me, it, look, it all comes back. We can talk about pace all we want to. We can talk about scoring it all we want to. It all comes back to what Carolina is able to do on the defensive end of the floor. That's what's been carrying this team this entire season. And if they bring the intensity that we know they are capable of bringing and bring it for 40 minutes, I'd like to say 40 minutes, but the majority of the game at least, then Carolina should be able to win this one. All right, so we've set the scene for Carolina and Alabama. We come back. We'll get into our discussion topic before we give our keys to the game and, of course, pick the game. But first, we got to play you a quick word from one of our partners. Hey there, Josh here for the Autograph Fandom app. Want to get rewarded for listening to our show? The team at Autograph, co-founded by Tom Brady, is redefining the fan experience by letting users earn points for the acts of fandom they take every day, like listening to this show. The Autograph Fandom app gives you access to your favorite UNC content in one place and offers rewards like tickets, exclusive merchandise, and much more. You're already listening to our show, but now you can earn points and get rewarded for it. Head over to the Apple App Store and search for Autograph Fandom Rewarded and download it today for free using the referral code HEELTOUGH. Link and code are also in our podcast description. Welcome back inside the Four Corners Podcast. Hanging out on a Tuesday night, getting you ready for Carolina and Alabama. A game will come your way 9.39 p.m. on Thursday night on CBS. So tonight's discussion topic is if you go back to Selection Sunday, you know Hubert Davis broke down the tournament into – three mini tournaments. You had the Charlotte Invitational, uh, the LA Invitational, and if you win that, you go to the Phoenix Invitational. And um, Carolina played really well in the Charlotte Invitational. They blew out Wagner. They ran away from Michigan State in the second round. And, um, you know, the big reason why was in the Michigan State game, you got, uh, you know, 17 points from Harrison Ingram. He made five threes. Cormac Ryan added 14 points. They combined to score 31. That really helped Carolina in a multitude of different ways. And then the win over Wagner, you had Jalen Withers, you know, putting together a double-double in front of his home crowd and Seth Trimble doing all the little things um, to, to really provide a lift off the bench. So which does Carolina need to carry – uh, over more from the Charlotte Invitational to the LA Invitational. Production from Harrison Ingram and Cormac Ryan uh, from the starting group from a scoring standpoint or contributions off the bench from Jalen Withers and Seth Trimble. And I think you could throw Jalen Washington in the mix because he's played rather well offensively as of late. 
Ah, uh, can I go with yes? Because both need to carry over. But no, the more important one is definitely the support from the other starters because we said that coming in. They need those two guys primarily to be able to score it. And now, I mean, with 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 the way that Elliot Cadeau is playing offensively. I mean, it's just – it's unavoidable at this point. And, I mean, look, he wasn't terrible the other day. I mean, he he had six points. They, they were big at the time. But he's not a guy – I mean, he's had open looks and he hasn't been able to knock them down. It, you just – you know that he is limited offensively. So you need these other two guys to continue to play at a high level. And, I mean, Harrison Ingram, you know, four of seven in the first game against Wagner – Nine points, but wasn't really needed because you had Armando dominating inside. RJ had a really nice game with 22 points and Cormac Ryan with 13. Then when Carolina needs him to step up a little bit more in the game against Michigan State, he, you know, puts in 17 points, knocks down five threes. And more importantly, you saw him sort of get into a groove again, rebounding wise. And that's something else you're going to want to see from him in this game and really these these next two games out there in L.A. But, yeah, I mean, I think that's the most important thing because if you can get that type of support around R.J. Davis and Armando Baycott, it's going to help you because along the way, somebody's going to figure out how to take one of those two guys out of the game. It just we, we, we saw it, we see it in every tournament run. There's somebody that eventually figures out, and taking them out is, uh, or really, that was the wrong phrasing, slowing them down. Even if you limit, you know, R.J. Davis to 12, 14 points, that's a big deal for Carolina on the offensive end of the floor. So you need somebody else to step up. And with what we saw here in Charlotte, I feel more confident that Carolina will be able to do that because, uh, yeah, it's like I said when we talked after the ACC tournament, I was a little concerned about the fact that those guys – in that moment, they, you, you saw two straight games where both of those guys were really, really quiet. But they have responded, both played well in Charlotte, and hopefully that carries over out here in L.A. Yeah, in this game, there's no doubt about it. Um, you got to have Ingram and, and Ryan scoring because they're going to have favorable matchups. Like, they're, they're, they're going to have opportunities to score because of how – a deficient Florida is uh, uh, defensively as a team, as a program, or Alabama is as a team and as a program. And so you got you to gotta take advantage of that. This cannot be a game where they're giving you nothing burgers because at this point you're not expecting much scoring from Elliott Cadeau. Mm -hmm. You're expecting him to facilitate and, 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 and run your offense, um, which means the other guys got to put the ball in the basket. I think what you saw from the first weekend – um, I think it's fair to expect RJ and Armando to put their best foot forward because this is why they came back was to get back into this moment, get back in this environment um, and play deep into the tournament. So it's the other guys that you need to um, play at their highest level. And look, Carolina's going to need Withers. They're going to need Trimble to make plays and, 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 and impact the game. But you need – this needs to be a game where four of your five starters are in double figures. Um, because you're going to have to score, I would probably say, at a bare minimum, 80 points to win the game. You, you probably can't mm -hmm. win this game, you know, because I, I don't see this game being played in the 60s or the 70s um, because Carolina wants to run too. So I don't, I don't see them trying to make this a half-court game. They're not going to be intimidated by Alabama's pace or their speed or, or their athleticism. They're going to want to get the ball and run as well. With, so with that, you got to put the ball in the basket and – Hopefully what we saw from Ingram and from Ryan and Charlotte carries over as we arrive here in L.A. With that, we'll transition and get to our keys to the game um, before we give our prediction for the game. The first key, uh, you know, is arguably the most important. Now, depending on what Carolina does in this category, the other two keys could, could be deemed rather, uh, you know, not important. Carolina's got to guard the three-point line. Um, and, and, look, they've defended the three-line well for the majority of the season. They've had games where they haven't defended the three-line well. Um, you look at their losses, a big reason why they've gotten beaten when they've gotten beaten, they didn't guard the three-point line the way that they need to. 
This is the best three point shooting team they have seen. Um, I think I think Alabama has like six or seven dudes on their roster that have shot ninety threes or more. That means that virtually every lineup on the floor is going to feature someone that can shoot the three point the the, the the three point shot, and their coach is going to encourage it. He's not going to discourage it. If they start two for twelve, guess what? They're going to shoot it twelve more times. And so this has to be a game where Carolina's game plan is as good as it's been. Their communication is as good as it's ever been. And the way they defend ball screens has to be as good as it's been all year long. Mm -hmm. Um, Going under screens in this game simply is not an option. You've got to fight over and blitz every screen because if not, they're going to jack threes and they're going to make threes and they're going to make them left and right. Um, I, I I think it's too much to ask to to say to not give up eight made threes because of how many Alabama's going to may uh, take. This cannot be a game though where they make 12, 13, 14 threes. Um, you you've got to show some resistance in that area of the game, and so um, you know Carolina has been very quality a uh, quality defensive team all year long. They defended the three line. Uh, for the majority of the season, as well as they have in, in my lifetime. And um, that needs to carry over in a big way on Thursday night, because if not, Alabama is more than capable of shooting you out of the gym. Well, if not, then you better be matching them on the other end. Like I said earlier, you're going to have to basically match them um, blow for blow to keep up because yeah, I mean, if they're knocking down 12, 13, 14 threes, I mean, you're going to be in trouble. And you're right. They're a team that is certainly capable of that because, yeah, in terms of three-point attempts, you nailed it. They have seven guys that are that, that have shot over 93 so far this season. So every guy on the roster, I mean, this is, this is a part of what they do. I mean, I'm looking now. I think they have uh, – okay, they, they have three – their top three scorers have shot the ball more from two than from three. But all of the other guys, the other four – they have shot the ball more from three than they've shot it from um, from inside the, the uh, three-point arc. So, I mean, that's just what it is. They're, they're a team that that's their focus. They know that's the best way to score, the most efficient way to score. And so uh, that's what they're going to do. And so, yeah, for Carolina, I mean, you talked about it, about blitzing ball screens. They have to. They've been doing it, um, you know, at certain times this year. They've done it, and they've done a great job. And I think that's got to be one of the focuses that they they bring to this game. But the other thing is communication is incredibly important against a team like this. That was part of the reason that you saw some of the breakdowns that Carolina had in those games where they struggled to defend the three was because the communication simply was not there. This game, it has to be. That's the most crucial thing that you have to do when you're out there. If you're going to switch something, you need it needs to be communicated because, yeah, it's one thing to switch on to somebody. You need somebody that's switching and is staying with somebody to not allow them to get free because if you give this team even the slightest bit of space, they're going to have guys that will knock down shots. Now, the one thing is, is we don't know their best three-point shooter percentage-wise, Latrell Reitzel Jr., not sure if he's going to play in the game. He left the last game with a concussion. Um, don't know. I haven't seen anything that says whether or not he's going to play in this game. But even if they don't have him, to still have six guys on the roster that rely on the three heavily as a part of their game, Carolina's got to be aware of it. But, again, it's just about doing the things that you've you've been capable of doing the entire season, and it all starts with talking. The second key to the game is your backcourt's got to outplay their backcourt. It's March. Guard play um, is the most important thing this time of the year. You got a fantastic guard matchup in the second round with R.J. Davis going up against Tyson Walker. You've got an even uh, you've got an even better one in this in this round with R.J. Davis going up against Mark Sears, a guy that you know averages like 0. .2 points per game more often or more more than RJ. You know those two dudes are going to put on a show and they're going to put on a duel. But it's what do your other guys in the backcourt do? This has to be a game where Elliot Cadeau is a factor and mm-hmm. can can put the ball in the basket. 
Um, they're going to play off of him. They're going to dare him to take the three-point shot. And to be fair, he needs to take the three-point shot. The biggest thing I've stressed all year long about his three-point uh, when, when he shoots the three is where is Armando Bay caught on the floor? If he's in a good floor balance to get an offensive rebound, I have absolutely no problem with you taking it. If he's not in a, in a position to probably get to the glass, um, probably don't take that one. Uh, what does Seth Trimble do off the bench? Do you get good Seth Trimble, a guy that, um, A, is making a difference defensively, but B, is driving the ball, getting to his mid-range, and and looking to to score the ball that way? And then Cormac Ryan, is he going to make shots, or is he going to be a bit of a non-factor in uh, on that end of the court? And so um, I think this is as big of a challenge Carolina's Backcourt's faced maybe since the UConn game because of how good UConn's backcourt is uh, collectively. But, um, you know, we, we talk about guard play being uh, the key to a deep tournament run. It, you know, you, you it showed up in the second round against Michigan State. It's showing up here in the Sweet 16 again. Whichever backcourt has the better game on Thursday night, I think comes away victorious. Yeah, and I mean, look, Carolina, this this is going to be a big challenge because they've got some of the best guards in the entire country. But, yeah, it's on Cormac Ryan to step up. Um, it's on, you know, Seth Trimble's got to – I think he, he's going to have to play better offensively um, than he's played, you know, these last few games because I, I got to be honest, I just don't know what Elliot Cadeau is going to be able to do. I mean, in terms of – knocking down shots from the outside. I mean, they're going to be there for him, and hopefully he can knock down at least one. But at this point, I, I just I, – I, there's not much confidence that that's going to happen. So Seth Trimble's got to be the guy that steps up. And even if those two just combine and can give you maybe 14, 15 points combined, I think you would live with that and let the other guys – I mean, R.J. Davis, I think, is going to be ready for this matchup. Because coming in, I think everybody's going to expect Mark Sears to be the guy that scores the most points that everybody's talking about in the game because he's shooting over 50% from the field and because he's shooting the way that he is from three. I think R.J. Davis will put, um, you know, if he needs to, will put this team on his back and take over the game. But I think those two guys, you're right, will probably go blow for blow like we thought we'd see with him and Tyson Walker. It's about what everybody else does around them. But the other thing is, is that Carolina is going to hold the advantage when it comes to the forwards and when it comes to stretching the floor. This is another game where he's not a guard, but you need Harrison Ingram to play well and shoot the ball well from the outside because that's the guy that can help you match the production that you're going to get on the other end from the Alabama guards, especially from the outside. If he can have another good day shooting the ball um, from the perimeter, then I think Carolina has a really good chance to win this game. I don't know if, if you know Alabama's backcourt outscores Carolina, if that means that that's it. There's no chance Carolina wins. But I think Carolina has to at least be able to match them uh, when it comes to some of the other guys. Uh, you know, you need Cormac Ryan to play well, and you need those guys off the bench to step up if they want to, you know, at, at least let this come down to the big men where Carolina holds the advantage. Yep, and that, <clears throat> that brings us to our last key of the game, um, which I, I think Carolina's got to win the rebounding battle. Uh, Bama statistically matches up well with you. They average over 39 rebounds per game. Um, and the Carolina's coming off a rebounding performance that wasn't good on, on, on Saturday. They got out-rebounded 37 to 31 Um by Michigan State, you were able to overcome that because of how well you you shot the ball and, and the way you were able to create, uh, you know, turnovers and, and score off of them. But, you know, this has to be a game where Carolina is getting second chance looks, but also, um, you know, holding Alabama to one shot. You know, Greg Ward comments and says, I think Mondo has a big game. We need to own the glass. And I couldn't agree more. I, I, I think um, you, you've seen you've seen the good Armando since we got to March because he knows what this month is all about. That sense of urgency is there. And I do think Carolina needs to own the glass. And I do think that they need to 
um, you know, be aggressive and, and, and send guys to the offensive glass with knowing that if, if, if they don't miss or, or Alabama is going to look to run off of your misses. And on the flip side, you got to hold them to one shot. Don't let them get an offensive rebound, reset their offense. Cause that's when their, their three point game really comes into play uh, because the best time to shoot a three is off an offensive rebound. And so, um, if there's one thing you liked about the Michigan State win was that they left some areas for Carolina to improve upon uh, for Heber Davis to still have his team's attention when they uh, got ready for practice and they got ready for Bama. Rebounding was one of them, and so this has to be a vintage Armando Baycott rebounding game combined with the rebounding efforts we've seen throughout the season from other guys, in particular Harrison Ingram. And it feels like the bigger the stage, the bigger the spotlight – those two guys know what to do, and um, this is as big a stage they've played on all season long, and they need to own the glass like their life depends on it on Thursday night. Yeah, one of the interesting things about what happened the other night, if you watch that Grand Canyon game back, was that the guards were the guys that rebounded the ball for Alabama. I mean, 12 for Mark Sears, uh, 10 for Aaron Estrada. It wasn't the big guys. Grant Nelson, Grant Nelson – who is their big man, has had one rebound in each of the two games so far. So that's an area that Carolina should dominate down low, and that's the thing. I think on the glass, they have a really good chance to do that because, I mean, you go back to the first game that that uh, Alabama played in uh, against Charleston. I mean, they had 34 rebounds. They were out-rebounded in that game by eight. So Carolina is a much better rebounding team than uh, Charleston, and I mean, for Grand Canyon, I mean, they're, they're built, they're a team that's pretty much all guards. I mean, that, that that was one of the reasons why they probably weren't able to advance as far as they wanted to was because of the way that they were built. Alabama matched up well with that. Um, this is where, you know, that now I will say, Carolina's guards, especially on the defensive end of the floor, they have to be able to be ready to get rebounds. This is a team that shoots so many threes there's going to be a lot of long rebound opportunities. So they've got to be able to get to those loose balls and not give Alabama second chances because this offense, as efficient as it is, they don't need to have extra opportunities. But, yeah, inside, I mean, Carolina should dominate. And you would hope, especially on the offensive glass, that Carolina would be able to take advantage of some of those extra opportunities because – this is just a team that does not stack up with them on the interior. This is where Armando Baycott should be able to go to work, or Jalen Withers, who's been uh, rebounding a lot better, should be able to go to work. Jalen Washington, even to a certain extent, should be able to have a good night on the glass for Carolina. But you're right. The guy that really determines it all here is what does Harrison Ingram do on the glass? And defensively, you know, I, I, he's I, he's going to be out on the perimeter, so that's a great guy that you want to have for those long rebounds. I think on the offensive glass, we've seen when Carolina's offense has been at its best this year, it's when they're getting those second chance opportunities. Not just not not because of Armando Baycott; those are there at, at times for him, but more so, it's it's about Harrison Ingram hitting that offensive glass. He'll have a chance to do that in this game against a smaller Alabama team. And if he does and creates those extra opportunities, it's going to be really hard for me to see a path for Alabama to beat Carolina um, when it's all said and done. Carolina enters with a 50.4% chance to win the game. According to ESPN's matchup predictor that tells you, according to ESPN, how tightly contested uh, this game figures to be. And, Carolina is a four and a half point favorite to win the game, according to ESPN Bet. You tell me who wins the game and why. I think Carolina wins the game, and I think it's because of what we talked about there at the end. I truly believe that Carolina's ability to get the ball inside, and we've seen it, the focus the first two games has been get the ball to the interior and go to work. The teams don't have the power inside to match up with you. This game's going to be no different. Grant Nelson's a guy that plays around 15, 16 minutes a game so far in this tournament. And even when they go to Jaron Stevenson, a guy who Carolina fans should be very familiar with, remembering him as a recruit, he does not have the size to be able to compete inside with Armando Baycott. And, and you know, the way he's been playing, Jalen Withers. So I think Carolina, that's that's got to be 
their main focus in this game. The guards have to shoot well. There's no question about it, and I think they will. They'll shoot well enough. But I think Carolina really takes it to them on the inside. I think Carolina responds on the glass, puts together a strong rebounding performance. And while I do think there will be moments where Alabama will score the ball, I think it'll be a lot like what you saw the other night if you watched Alabama, where there were moments, there were bursts, little bursts where Alabama were able to score it, but it wasn't consistent because of the way that Grand Canyon defended. Carolina is more talented than Grand Canyon is, and they are a better defensive team than Grand Canyon is. I think that'll show in this game, and I think Carolina finds a way to emerge in this one and advance on to the elite. Yeah, I I think Carolina wins. I think this is a motivated group because they're going to show up again for the second straight weekend, being told that they're going to get beat and that they're the weakest one seed. They're the most vulnerable one seed uh, in the in the field. Um, you know, I, I, I think this will be a team that will – uh, appreciate what they accomplished last weekend because they're still playing, but realize they could play better and they've got to play at a higher level to get back to the final four. And, and so um, I think RJ and Armando are going to continue to play at the level that you're going to play at, but I don't think Cormac Ryan's ready to be done playing. I don't think Harrison Ingram is ready to be done playing with this group. Um, and so I think Carolina puts together maybe their most complete performance of the tournament so far I think they rise to the occasion. I think they meet the challenge that Alabama's offense presents them. Um, and I think Carolina earns um, a win on Thursday night to advance to their second Elite Eight in three years under Hubert Davis. Well, no matter what happens, guys, we'll have you covered on the website, HeelToughBlog.com, where we want you to make us your home for the best NCAA tournament coverage. Uh, we'll have the preview of the game posted uh, well, Thursday morning, we'll have you covered with the late tip. Uh, so we'll post it Thursday morning. And, of course, we'll have you covered following the game as well um, as, I continue, as I continue to take you through the basketball season, spring football practice, well underway in Chapel Hill. Any, any noteworthy uh, stuff coming out of uh, spring practice, Anthony will have you covered on that front. Just get in the habit every single day, guys. Visit the website, hilltuffblog.com. For the best Carolina basketball and Tar Heel football coverage. As for the podcast, guys, you know where to find us. Every major podcasting platform. Simply search us on, uh, uh, simply search the Four Corners podcast and we will pop up. We're there. We encourage you guys to rate, review, and subscribe. That way you don't miss any editions of the show throughout the remainder of the basketball season. Well, with that, guys, this is going to wrap up this edition of the show. Do you want to thank Anthony once again for hosting with me? We want to thank you guys for watching and listening. And as always, go Tar Heels.